Hello, folks. Well, good morning. Really early morning if you're in the USA. Good evening if you're in uh, Australia and New Zealand. And, and, and good morning for me. But we are now kind of nearly halfway through our El Alamein marathon. And if you saw, saw the shows yesterday, Mike Bechtol was fantastic talking about tactical air power. And yesterday we had in the morning, Craig Tibbetts gave us a run through of the Australian Ninth Division, uh, particularly at the battle, the second battle of El Alamein. But today we're broadening things out in some ways and we're narrowing in other. In that we're broadening out in the terms of we're, we're talking about from 41 to 43, but the narrow focus we are talking about the role of the New Zealanders. So Professor Glyn Harper has joined me again for a second time. He was on very recently, in fact, talking about the New Zealanders in, in Crete and a little bit about Greece, but he's back on today to talk about North Africa. He has written a book about the New Zealanders in North Africa, uh, the Battle of North Africa, El Alamein, and the Turning Point for World War II, the link to purchase it on Amazon in the UK, US, and then there's a publishing link to New Zealand. It's in the description below. If you're new to World War II TV, please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to click that little bell so you receive the notifications, and please consider becoming a channel member and or a patron so we can keep on going long into the future. But without further ado, I'm going to bring Glenn in. So, good evening, Glenn. How are you today? Yeah, very well, thanks, Paul. So, one of the, before we bring up your PowerPoint and we, we dive into the presentation, El Alamein, one of the questions I'm asking everybody over these two weeks is, is, is where it falls in, in your interpretation of, of him being important. You know, we, we've, we've, we've talked yeah. about the fact that in Israel, for example, it's seen as the salvation of Palestine because it prevented the, the Third Reich getting getting that far. In Britain, I grow up with yeah. comics and and playing El Alamein in the Battle of in back in the back garden. Americans, it's less well known. In New Zealand, kind of where does it rank? And you personally, as a, as a as a as a pivotal battle? Uh, well, I think it is a pivotal battle of the Second World War for a number of reasons, and not just the fact that New Zealanders were, were intimately involved with it, but the fact it's the really the first uh, comprehensive defeat of, a, of an army led by Germans, although it's mainly made up of Italians, and it, it alters a major mindset. Um, it convinces the British Empire that they can now you know, match the Germans and they, it ends this long chain of disasters, which has really started from, a, from about 1940 onwards. So I think it's an important battle. Um, problem is it's not that well known in New Zealand. Uh, we tend, we're a strange nation. We tend not to dwell on military victories very much. The, the uh, battles that strike in our public consciousness are what I call heroic defeats, where we almost do it, but not quite. And they're really only, there are really three big ones, Gallipoli, um, Passchendaele in the First World War and Monte Cassino in the Second World War, where uh, we struggle, but, but uh, you know, struggle valiantly, but don't actually do it. Uh, for some reason, we don't focus on, our, on the victories very much, and El Alamein is virtually forgotten in New Zealand, I have to say. Well, that, that is interesting yeah. about the perceptions globally. And we'll, we'll talk perhaps at the end, because the other thing I'm asking, mm. I warn you in advance, the other thing I'm asking everybody is to give their kind of thumbnail um, sketch of, of, of Rommel and Montgomery, because that, you know, you can't end up talking about North Africa without mentioning those two figures. They loom large in everything. And we've yep. talked about the fact there are between three and 500 books written about El Alamein. <laughs> some of them are brilliant and some of them are not so brilliant, but... You know, you can't do a book on it without talking about those figures. Everybody has an opinion. So far, people have been pretty much in agreement, but that'll come later on. But right now, we'll fire up your PowerPoint, which you're in control of, folks. We're going, say, from 41 to 43 there. If we have any questions pertinent to the slide, we'll kind of do it as we go along. Anything bigger about, you know, the New Zealand contribution to World War II on a more broad level, we'll do that at the end. So, um, yeah, over to you, Glenn. Well, thank Oh. Then your audio is frozen. Damn. Oops. I love it when it happens, technology like this. We've seemed to have Glenn has frozen for a second. Um, hopefully we'll come back in a minute. But while we're waiting for Glenn to come back in, um, our second show. Oh, are you there, Glenn? Yeah, I think I am. I'm not sure what happened then, Paul. Yeah, we, we froze for a second there. Okay, no worries. Well, you're back now. Well, over to you. Well, We'll soldier on. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk why they're in North Africa, look at uh, the arrival of Rommel and how he really shook things up in that theatre of war. I'm going to talk about New Zealanders' involvement in Operation Crusader, which is still um, the bloodiest battle New Zealanders fight in during the, during the whole Second World War. 
Now look at uh, their move to Syria, which really uh, Freiburg pushed to get the New Zealanders out of 8th Army, so you concentrate on some realistic training. Their involvement after the Battle of Gazala, I'll talk about 1st Alamein, I'll talk about Alam Halfa, and I'll talk about the October Al Alamein battle as well. If I have time, I'll look at what happens after Al Alamein, because the New Zealanders stay involved uh, in the pursuit of Rommel across North Africa. They conduct three left hooks in an effort to outflank him, but they're all unsuccessful. I'll look at Tobago Gap uh, very briefly and come to some conclusion about the end. So I'm Start with a recap. Why are they in North Africa? There are th three strategic viewpoints to consider. What does North Africa mean for Britain and Italy and Germany? And for Britain, there's no doubt they consider this a vital area to defend. As one British historian said, this is the fulcrum of empire. If we lose this, we lose the whole British empire. So they are there fighting to defend what they consider a vital strategic area of interest. Italy too has uh, a deep interest in this, having taken Libya and also with other possessions in Africa, and they are keen to carve out a new Roman Empire in this region. Whereas Germany really has little interest. Um, they are there to support an ally. Um, they commit uh, small forces initially, and then when things go badly, they actually start to take it seriously and commit a much larger force. Um, but they really have little interest, which is surprising given the oil assets uh, that are in this region and, and definitely given the, the Suez Canal. Uh, the, Initial hit which starts off quite well. Um, the British have some important successes in 1940, the Taranto naval battle, for example, then uh, when the defeat of the Italian invasion of Egypt in Operation Compass, and they're able to push the Italians right back into Libya. And for a for a small moment, it looks like this could be the end of the war in North Africa for Italy. But then, as we know, and something that I covered in my last talk, the British make the decision that they need to prop up and send forces to Greece. So they halt the offensive in the Western Desert. They shift their best forces to Greece in really a token effort to prop up that country in a campaign which, according to General Freiburg, was intimately involved, violated every principle of war. And really, this could only end one way, and it did. A massive uh, retreat, a massive defeat, a tragedy and a disaster uh, for, the, for the British at this time. And of course, this coincides with the arrival of Rommel in North Africa, the build-up of this uh, Deutsches Afrika Corps. Um, Rommel has been described, and I think it's an apt description. I, I, I have to come down the side. I don't think he's a military genius at all, as many people would argue, but he's a, certainly a dashing cavalry commander. He's determined to make his mark. He's aggressive, and he in the, on the 30th of March, despite being told to wait and build up your forces, he launches his first attack, and it's a, Im immensely successful. He drives the British out of Libya, with the exception of Tobruk, and he manages in the process to capture Britain's best field general, one General Richard O'Connor. Um, Tobruk does hold out, as we know, and in some ways it becomes Rommel's obsession. It's isolated, it holds out, it becomes part of the Australian folklore because this is the first really uh, big battle for the 9th Australian Division, which also fights a, a pivotal and plays a pivotal role in Al Alamein. Um, and, but we must not overlook the fact that British and Polish forces also serve here. Rommel becomes obsessed with it, becomes determined to capture it, and the British become determined to relieve it. It becomes almost a symbol of defiance. Um, so the British come up with several plans to actually relieve the siege of Tobruk. Uh, the early attempts are absolute failures. Uh, two operations called, uh, uh, one called Operation Battle Axe, um, and the other called Operation Brevity, which pretty much sums up uh, how, it, how it went. Short, sharp, and absolute failures. Um, I have to say, this leads to the demise of General Wavell, who has really done an outstanding job, if, if someone I recognised, and is replaced with General Claude Auchinleck, who looks the part, but is basically a stranger to the British Army because he comes from the Indian Army, and really he does not know a lot about uh, combined arms and fighting modern modern battles. Um, now, Auchinleck is ordered to prepare a major offensive to drive Rommel and Axis forces out of eastern Libya and to relieve 
to Brook, and he comes up with a plan of this big operation called Operation Crusader. And it is up, launched on the 18th of November, 1941, and it becomes apparent to most people that there is something wrong with the way the British Army is fighting. In this plan, the armour and infantry fight separate battles. You have the armour, and you can see them to the bottom of, of, of the screen, those armoured divisions swanning off into the desert, hopefully attracting the Italian and German armour and, and basically having a big stoush in the desert. Meanwhile, the infantry will plod along, take the, take the, uh, fort, the frontier forts, and hopefully get uh, help assist the armour to get close and relieve Tobruk. Um, so they're, they're fighting separate battles. The best of the infantry are divided up into either brigade groups or jock columns, so they're split up into four into small ineffective groups, and this becomes a confusing, hotly contested battle. Now Rommel easily won the armoured battle, in fact they did it in, in an afternoon, but he couldn't overcome the infantry relieving Tobruk, and then he made a fatal mistake, his drive to the wire, which takes him out of the battle, and when he comes back, he manages to overrun the infantry that are on two key ridges around Tobruk, a place called City Razig and Belhamid. Uh, but his losses have been precarious, his supply situation is desperate, and he's forced to retreat back to Alagelia. Um, and he leaves behind 30,000 uh, uh, POWs, mostly Italians. This has all the hallmarks of a British victory, and I'd use that in inverted commas, but its cost was very high. The 8th Army suffers some 18,000 casualties. Um, here's some images of the battle. And the New Zealanders, who I have to say do the brunt of the infantry fighting around Tobruk, suffer enormously. They suffer some 4,620 casualties, so almost a quarter of the casualties in this one division. 879 killed, another 1,609 uh, wounded, and over 2,000 missing. They're largely uh, prisoners of war. They, their casualties are 30% of the 8th Army's total, and it is quite ironic that this first British success, and I'll put that in inverted commas, actually cost the New Zealanders more in casualties than Greece and Crete, com than Greece and Crete combined. So it's not a great start to their fighting in the desert, even though most people have acknowledged that they have performed remarkably well. Freiburg isn't happy with the way things are being run in 8th Army. Freiburg doesn't get on at all with Auchinleck, and he insists that he, his uh, division is sent away somewhere where he can concentrate it and train it in modern doctrine, particularly clumping all its artillery together as one complete five, five unit and also doing combined arms training with infantry, artillery, engineers. Um, he, Freiburg is convinced that this dispersion of infantry, particularly in brigade groups, will lead to nothing but disaster. So they are sent away to train and they have some five months in Syria in 1942. Interestingly, interestingly, the 9th Australian Division is also sent to Syria at this time to do training of their own and, and also to keep an eye on the border up in that region. And while you're having a sip of water, Glenn, one yep. of the things that came up with John Parshall and John, the American historian, is 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 in the middle of his twelve his twelfth year in writing a book about 1942, and he's two years away from completing wow. it. So he has done a massive <laughs> great dive into 1942. Yeah. And he says at the heart of of how the Allies came out of 42, and this is globally, not just in the Western uh, Desert, mm -hmm. is is the mm -hmm. improvement of combined arms. And, and you know, and you talked yep. about combined arms earlier, yep. and, and I think. I'd like, you know, I'd like to ask you just, well, you've, you've made it clear already that uh, the, the British or the mm. Allied use of combined arms in Crusader is is is, is not good. And it, so, it's woeful, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we talked about Freiburg in, in Crete and New Zealand and, you know, in, in a sense last time, mm. you know, ha fighting with an arm tied behind his back. And mm. this mm. is, this to me, the way you're saying he's going off this five months of train, this, this is really important because by the time mm. I mean, oh, we're skipping ahead of it, you may be saying this later. By the time Montgomery yeah. takes over the Eighth Army, there has been this sort of symbiotic change of attitude to combined arms. Things have been coming in, different ideas have been coming in. College Shore with the Tactical Air Force, then later on Conningham, and yeah. and the use of mm. artillery mm. with Kirkman. So, so, so Freiburg is actually quite a, a, a um, important figure in this in this change of attitude. Mm. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I have to say the um, concentration of artillery and the fire patterns they develop, particularly one called Stonks and another one called Murder, actually adopted by the British 8th Army and then by British artillery uh, during the rest of the war. So in some ways, Freiburg is quite a forward thinker in, in, in this regard. Um, this notion of combined arms is something that is, is a theme through my talk. Uh, I would argue they actually don't get it right until Tobago Gap which is in April 1943, which is leaving it somewhat late. Um, as Alexander McKee said, they uh, the, at long last, he's, he's talking about the Second Battle of El Alamein or the October Battle, he says at long last the British uh, were able to, had learned how to make war, which is not the same thing as fighting, you know, um, you, because mm. you've actually got to do it, do it properly. Um, shall I push on, Paul? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just yeah, want to yeah, make yeah, that yeah. Oh, No, 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 that, that, that's fine. So the New Zealand division is up in Syria, actually enjoying themselves, doing some some really tough training um, in the desert, uh, developing some new new doctrine. When all of a sudden they they are uh, called to the desert because what's happened is that on the twenty seventh of May, Rommel's opened the Battle of Gazala, which Eighth Army knew the attack was coming, and they were expecting that it would be a pushover because they enjoyed a three to one superiority in tanks, three to two superiority in guns, and also had air superiority superiority as well what they didn't have was the correct leadership uh doctrine and of course uh, a lot of their tanks were, were, were also uh, not up to, not up to speed they are implementing this brigade group doctrine and they are outmaneuvered out generaled and out fought um this as i say this becomes the worst defeat for the eighth army in the western desert and they fall back and did not stop falling back until they reached the El Alamein line only 60 miles from Alexandria Alexandria things are going really bad there's a massive panic back in Cairo and Auchinleck summons urgently the second New Zealand division and the ninth Australian division to return from Syria and to actually join again with the eighth army there are two significant events um, that occur uh, while this is happening to Brook Falls, the garrison of Tobruk Falls on the 21st of June with 35,000 uh, men, which is actually more than Rommel actually had in the army at the time, and falls with a massive amount of supplies for Rommel to keep his offensive going. With the capture of Tobruk, Rommel was promoted to, to uh, Field Marshal by Adolf Hitler. It's the second thing that happens, and this is somewhat indicative of the state of Eighth Army in this time, is that the New Zealanders are left stranded on an escarpment at Minka Kaim. They believe they're about to take part in a big set-piece battle that is going to, to stop Rommel's advance in his track. So they're preparing for that, and while they're preparing for that, the flanking formations on either side of them withdraw because Auchinleck has changed his mind. He's not going to fight around Mirza Matru. He's going to fight back on the Alamein line. Nobody told the New Zealand division that that was happening. So there they are on the escarpment, uh, de dealing to the Afriki Corps as they're advancing, particularly with their clustered artillery, but there is no flank protection. So they are virtually surrounded by 21st Panzer Division, and they're only able to break out in a daring night attack, which you can see in the in the famous painting by Peter McIntyre down down the bottom. During the process, uh, Freiburg is seriously wounded. He gets a shell splinter through his neck, and he's taken out of this battle. Um, it is was a near-run thing, and in its very first action, the New Zealand division is almost surrounded, and it's only this daring night breakout uh, which prevents that from happening. But they lose a 1,000 casualties in a year where they're getting no reinforcements um, at all, which makes it rather... Uh, which makes this a serious incident. We then come to the battle on the Alamein line. Uh, this first, which has been labelled first battle of Alamein line, uh, Dorman Smith was the first person to actually say that this is the first battle of Alamein. You get, people call it first battle of Alamein or the July battle. I'll probably refer to it as first Alamein, which seems to become reasonably accepted now. The 8th Army is in disarray after the Battle of Gazala. Orkin Leck for the second time sacks the army commander, this time Ritchie, and takes over personal command and takes the decision to make a stand at Alamein. This is an important decision and it's a good decision because the El Alamein has no open flank. It's got the Mediterranean Sea in the north and a soft sea of soft sand, the Katara Depression, at the other end, which is supposed to be impassable. It could not be outflanked. 
and they only reached it just in time because on the 1st of July, Rommel, uh, re newly replenished from those supplies at Tobruk, crashes into the British positions at the Alamein line and is halted. He's down to 40 tanks and he's existing solely on captured supplies. But there is panic in Cairo. The British fleet actually spot away from Alexandria, get with uh, papers burnt, and there is three weeks of sporadic fighting, which either side is able to establish ascendancy on, on over the other, but Rommel is effectively stopped in this first battle of El Alamein. Now, during this first battle of El Alamein, the New Zealanders have another disaster. This is not great for New Zealand. They've gone from um, Minka Kaim, and they now go to the disaster of Rewisat Ridge. On the 15th of July, they carry out a night attack on Rewisat Ridge, which is a prominent feature in the centre of the line. They do that attack in conjunction with an Indian division. They are promised at the, in the morning there will be a whole British armoured brigade to seal off their exposed uh, left flank. Unfortunately, the British armour did not appear but the armour of the Axis forces did. And basically, they, they rolled up the two brigades of New Zealand infantry that were on the ridge. And here's the uh, situation at first look. You've got New Zealand battalions established firmly on the ridge. The open flank is where, uh, is where the uh, British armour is supposed to be. Instead, you have the Battle HQ of 15 Panzer Division, and they uh, immediately go in, into action. Um, this is a absolute disaster for New Zealand. Six Seems Glenn has frozen again now. We'll just uh, wait for him to come back. Folks, the second show today with Zeta Balanja Fletcher is about the December battles uh, between Rommel and Montgomery. Um, please stick around for that. Oh, you're back, Glenn. Yeah, you froze again. Yes, I know. So, um... I know. I'm, I'm not certain what it is, Paul. There is a big storm over New Zealand at the moment, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's affecting it or not, but we, we, we'll, we'll continue on. Um, yeah, it's good. This this battle and th is another disaster. Um Basically, there's little confidence in the, in the army leadership. Um, Auchinleck uh, is so desperate for a moment, he wants to bring back capital punishment for desertion and cowardice, which really um, is an indication of how out of touch he is. Um, he is sacked in July, and most men of 8th Army, I think, are pleased to see him go. Um, Churchill wants some new brooms. Churchill is desperate for some type of victory, uh, particularly so uh, so he can talk to the Americans about it, and he selects a couple of new brooms. Sorry, before I do this, I will tell a uh, rather amusing anecdote. This is to do with Ruizat Ridge, this battle here, and Kippenberger wrote an account of it to his wife, and he wrote in it that that uh, Auchinleck was more like a sergeant major than a general and that his wife could have run a, the, this battle better than Auchinleck did. Unfortunately, the British censor actually um, in, in, intercepted that letter and passed it on to Auchinleck, who told Freiburg to discipline Kippenberger rather, dr rather drastically. And he was also told that Kippenberger shows alarming disregard for censorship and discloses information that could be of, of benefit to the enemy. Um, I think the enemy probably already knew about it. We'll Given they'd already position. won, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Just, at this point, Glenn, I just want to, you know, ask about maybe even public opinion in New Zealand, opinion in, New Zealand in that, you know, you've had a couple of mm -hmm. specifically New Zealand disasters on the heels of, mm -hmm. of, of British disasters, mm -hmm. you know, and at what, mm -hmm. at what point is this is this getting back to New Zealand? Is there any kind of feeling about you know the the, the British throwing the New Zealanders into the into the, the worst parts of the battle and being let down and and you know allowed to be exposed and or are the public not being told? Uh, no, the public are well aware of it, particularly as those long casualty lists come back uh, mm. to New Zealand. Um, but you know the, this this is not just New Zealand. Uh, the whole British Empire is going through this time of despondency and you know Churchill's getting really frustrated you know and he, he, he rages to, to, to Alan Brooke you know haven't we got one general that can win a battle he's even he, this he even talk about that from, to Montgomery when Montgomery changes from uh from Lightfoot to uh to uh 
the breakout battle, which which I'll uh, talk about a, a little bit later on. Now, this is just very, very frustrating, and there is this despondency and this feeling that, uh, you know, can can we beat these people? Um, you know, they, there is certainly doubt in the in the New Zealand military, and there's doubt in the New Zealand government at the time, and I think the people are feeling very, very frustrated. And of course, you need to remember too, this is a time when New Zealand feels quite vulnerable with the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, and and uh, you know those things happening very close to them. So Churchill is looking for somebody who can win a battle for him. Um, he settles upon Alexander and a general called Gott. And Gott, I have to say, is a surprising choice, given that he's one, been one of the uh, most ineffectual commanders of uh, the Eighth Army and strongly believes in the value of brigade groups and jock columns, etc. cetera. Um, Gott is killed in an, in, when his aircraft is attacked. Um, and it's shot down and he's killed. And Montgomery is chosen instead. Um, and as the New Zealanders said, uh, as Kim Berger would like would say, no New Zealanders had ever heard of him. And he asked one uh, British uh, officer what Montgomery was like, and he was told he's understood to be mad, and he's probably going to get rid of some dead wood around here. His biographer admits that at this time Montgomery was probably about the most unpopular uh, general in the British Army. But this is his moment. He has he has this appointment, and he's determined to make the most of it. And we come to two turning point battles. Um, there is a stalemate on the Alamein line in July and August, and Rommel is facing huge supply difficulties, and he also knows that time is against him. He launches one last attempt to break through, which is known as the Battle of Alam Halfa. And Italian German forces attack on the 30th of August, but Eighth Army, you know, remarkably well informed by Enigma and so forth, knew the attack was coming, and they have prepared accordingly. There were the, the the front line was well prepared with dense minefields, massive artillery concentrations. The Desert Air Force was well informed and working hand in hand with with uh, with Montgomery under the leadership of Air Vice Marshal Coningham. So when this attack uh, starts, the Germans are well behind the eight ball. They have a tight schedule. They never re get anywhere near it. They're being pounded by the... Oh, Ian's frozen again. Wait for him to come back. Uh, folks, I just hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. It's absolutely, truly amazing information. Glenn is an absolute legend in, in New Zealand, as people have been, have been commenting in the sidebar. Again, thank you for your comments in the sidebar. Uh, it, it's, it's an increasing aspect of what we're doing here is the sidebar conversations are as good or as valuable as the actual main presentation. So thank you for joining in with us there. And we'll just wait for Glenn to come back in. It's these issues with tech. And as you said, there's a storm there. Um, oh, yeah. Apologize we were for just, that, Paul. We, yeah, we no can... worries. I, I filled in a bit. So you were just saying they were pounding oh. away is where you'd got to. Yeah, yeah pounding away um, and basically getting behind uh, the their, uh, their objectives, never getting close to taking the Alum Helfer Ridge where um, Montgomery has dug in a whole, a whole armoured division. There is, however, um, two uh, uh, counterattacks which failed dismally. Operation Bulumba by the Australians in the north and Operation Beresford by the New Zealanders attacking uh, when the uh, Italian and German forces are retreating. Um, they're both dismal failures. And once again, there's this lack of coordination, a lack of cooperation with armour. Uh, some units disobeyed orders. Um, and Montgomery becomes well aware of this deficiency. And Montgomery is aware that he needs to spend considerable time training his army before it's ready for use in a modern uh, set piece battle. But he is prepared to do that. And we lead on to uh, the. the this is Alam Halfa, Rommel's last attempt to break through. It is a defeat for Rommel and Montgomery's first victory. And it leads to a change in morale about, uh, about leadership in the 8th Army. As somebody, as one soldier wrote, last a plan that actually worked and a commander that seems to know what he's doing. Um, morale rose immensely after the Battle of Alam Halfa. And Montgomery is preparing for his big battle 
the the October battle, which will be a turning point battle. Now, Montgomery is no doubt about it was a very cautious commander, and he made sure that he wasn't going to attack until he was ready, amassing four times as many men, uh, three times as many tanks and guns, and massive air superiority, some 1,200 aircraft to the Axis 350. You can see a, a breakdown in these strengths by the comparisons down the bottom, uh, done rather crudely as a as a diagram, but you can see that the 8th Army has built up its strength and it's considerable. 23rd of October 1942, just over 80 years ago, um, the barrage opens and the Battle of Alamein is launched. On the 10 p.m. 23rd of October, the infantry from five divisions set off behind a, a some set off behind a creeping barrage, and it's interesting to see where the divisions come from. They are they come from South Africa, Australia, India the 51st Highland Division, the, the New Zealand Division as well. And of course, most of the armour is British and the New Zealand Division has a British armoured brigade under command, uh, the 9th Armoured Brigade, which performs immensely well. But the armoured divisions behind the infantry fail to move forward on time. The attack peters out into a slugging match and loses momentum. So Montgomery then shifts the focus of the attack in a secondary operation. This is the first battle is called Operation Lightfoot, the one on the 23rd of October, and he launches Operation Supercharge in November. And this is, I think, one of Montgomery's finest moments. And oh, I'll go, go back a little bit. I don't want to jump, jump forward because he switched the direction of the attack. He uses the 9th Australian Division in the north to fix the enemy through its crumbling operations while he prepared a new offensive further south. Its patterns are uh, General Patton's famous quote, tactics are easy, you hold them by the nose and you kick them in the pants. He probably didn't say pants, but, 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 but I will. Um, so he's got the 9th Division in the north holding Rommel by the nose while there is a massive attack prepared further south. And the New Zealanders control and direct that attack using British Armoured Brigade and also British Infantry Brigades. But they plan it and Freiburg is entrusted with delivering it. And it is the second battle, Operation Supercharge, from the 2nd to the 4th of November that leads to victory at El Alamein. And the Africa Corps is broken. And here is a quote from their, one of their war diaries. Officers of all ranks had lost their heads, were making hasty and inconsiderate decisions. The confidence that had been lost in some places, panic had broken out. Some vehicles had been set on fire. And basically, he is saying this is a defeat and, you know, the, 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 we, are, we have been shattered by this. There is a considerable amount of panic. Rommel breaks off the attack. The Germans steal most of the Italian transports, so leave uh, many Italians to be captured. And I have to say it's an Italian armoured division that is the last one fighting um, in this battle. Now, so this is this is a defeat in any stretch of the imagination. What can I say in an assessment of El Alamein? It is a battle of attrition, those, like those old-fashioned battles of the First World War, but one that lasts days rather than months. And victory went to the side with the deepest pockets. The Germans would lose 10,000 soldiers as POWs. The Italians had 20,000 soldiers taken as POWs, lost both sides lost, so the uh, Germans lost 450 tanks, 1,000 guns. This is a significant defeat in any stretch of the imagination. Now, Rommel, I have to say, was unwell during this battle. He was suffering from jaundice. He'd actually been in Berlin at the start of it, and it didn't help matters that the replacement commander died of a heart attack uh, just as the battle commenced. But Montgomery had shown significant skill. He lied about it afterwards when he said everything had gone according to his plan. It had not gone according to plan, but he had adapted well to the circumstances. And to my mind, this was the turning point for British forces in the war. It was made into a huge propaganda victory. It was immensely dependent on the soldiers of the British Empire the airmen of the British Empire, and it was especially dependent on the 9th Australian Division and the 2nd New Zealand Division as well um, to basically 
attack in the north. New Zealand is involved in light foot, but then directing and controlling Operation Supercharge. Um, shall I push on uh, and cover the rest of Africa, or Paul? I'm yeah, no, I leave think it so. There. Before you do, I just want to ask a couple of questions about about mm -hmm. um, the, the the necessity of the second battle, or in some ways the third battle, because we I think the Alam yeah. Halfa battle <laughs> could be the second battle, and this could be the third yeah. battle, but. You know, th there's been a debate on Twitter. Various historians were getting involved last week about whether or not yeah. it was absolutely needed, uh, the ground campaign, given that the landings in North Africa were just around the corner. Yeah. But what you said yeah. there yourself is it's the morale boost. It, it gives everybody. I mean, it arguably saves Churchill's career. Um, yep. Commanders like Freiburg, Monty, their, their reputations are kind of imp uh, improved by this. So. Whether or yeah. not it was actually ne needed on the ground, it was definitely needed for everybody's um, belief. I mean, I think going forward, as you said earlier, yeah. Yeah. there'd been this idea that this this army is in, we can't we cannot defeat this army, and now they have been defeated. Now the mopping up yeah. and things like, or the, the mopping up is the understatement, but the the pursuit yeah, yeah. perhaps doesn't go as yeah. as well. But would you agree that it absolutely is needed as a a, 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 a victory for the for the people? Absolutely. I, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, I think it was Corelli Barnett who in the Desert Generals were first wrote that this was an unnecessary battle and they should have just held the line while the, you know, the Americans landed at Operation Torch. Um, I'll point out later on the Americans had a few problems of their own, a place called Kazarine Pass. Um, but in terms of the mindset and the faith in yourself and the ability to actually fight and defeat the Germans, Alamein is absolutely critical. I love a comment that um, that uh, General Moore said, the, uh, the Australian commander said he mm. was going around the, the battlefield and he met this digger and this old digger said to him, and, and please excuse my the vernacular, but he said, it's tough, all right, sir, but at last we've got these bloody Germans by the knackers, you know, and that's that's the, the change, you know. They can, they've got them. They can match the Germans now, and they can defeat them. And this is immensely important when all you've had in North Africa um, since since Operation Compass, that great success, is disaster after disaster, yeah. and not just in North Africa as well. Yeah. This, is, uh, th this marks the turning of the tide the loss of initiative for the germans which i'll come which i'll cover at, at the at the end of the story i think it's i think it's a crucial battle and a battle that had to be fought and i would say to a battle that had to be won yeah no absolutely but, but, but please carry on it's absolutely fooling people loving it so um yeah oh, as okay. Oh, good, good stuff. Well, the El Alamein's over, and um, and as I said, great success. The church bells ring in in um, in England for the first time in in four years. Churchill makes a big speech saying, you know, we've actually started. Uh, you know, with uh, this is we've had an unfamiliar experience, a, a victory. Um, but he's not happy with what happens afterwards because the Eighth Army sets off in pursuit of uh, of Rommel and the Afrika Corps, and the pursuit is slow cautious and poorly coordinated um and there this is uh, i think uh, a, a major criticism because the uh the eighth army uh, the commanders everybody knows rommel's situation because you know he's radioing back and sending signals back to berlin which have been broken uh by Beachley park almost as soon as as soon as they've been written and they let rommel get away the new zealanders are involved in three flanking attacks and i have to say freiburg proved to be immensely cautious in carrying them out and the the germans were able to get back into uh, tunisia to the libyan border and the marath line and awaited opportunities to uh, to uh, attack again and they did so um we, we have operation torch uh, coming immediately um, after the the um, battle of El alamein um, and Rommel still has some tricks left, um, and he captures the U.S. Second Corps off guard at a place called Cap Kazarine uh, Pass, um, which I'll, I'll push on, yeah, which is a wake-up call for the for the United States. A couple of historians have argued that that tactical defeat probably did more to sort out U.S. forces and transform them into an effective fighting force than any other action of the war. Rommel has dealt 
uh, se severe blow to the Americans co coming in. He now turns back and he wants to deal another blow to Eighth Army, who are following up cautiously um, in Libya, reach Tripoli, and are advancing very, very slowly. And he turns back and fights him at a place called Medanine. Now, Medanine is a rather unknown battle, but I think it's an important one. It's actually Rommel's uh, swan song. Uh, Tripoli's been taken, Montgomery's following up, uh, Rommel's withdrawal with two weak divisions, the 51st Highland and the 7th Armoured, and they reached Medanine some 270 kilometres from Tripoli. R Rommel has fought at Kazarin, he now turns back and is going to attack Montgomery's small force with three armoured divisions on the 3rd of March 1943. But Forewarned by Ultra, Rom, uh, Montgomery rushes up more forces. He rushes forth the 50, 51st Highland Division, the uh, 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 Guards Brigade, um, the, the New Zealanders, with 7th Armoured in reserve, and he's ready when Rommel attacks on the 6th of, of the 6th of March. And Medanine is an absolute disaster for Rommel. Rommel attacked with 124 tanks and 16 battalions of infantry. He lost half the tanks in the, in the space of a single morning. 52 tanks, no British tanks were lost. It was Rommel's swan song, and he left uh, North Africa shortly after and did not return. I have to say, this battle does not indicate the, the work of a military genius. I mean, Rommel can be decisively defeated again, and it is Montgomery who has decisively defeated him at Medanine in March 1943. And just there to, to more... back up a little before, before you move on, Glenn, just to back up a little bit, yeah. we, we, I, yeah. I agree in the assessment about Medanine, but in the... In, in in Montgomery's pursuit of Rommel after the Second Battle of El Alamein, I mean, one of the things I think I'm playing devil's advocate slightly is that to consider is that he has now had all the toys out of the toy box. There's now nothing else coming to his theatre now, really. I mean, the build-up of the Eighth Army prior to Second Battle of Alamein, as you said there, the superior numerical strength he had there, but he's not getting any more now, is he? That's that, that's no. it. The Eighth Army is, I mean, they're obviously individual reinforcements, but no more units. So, it, isn't it the safe play to not to not run the risk of being pushed? You know, if if something goes badly wrong after after the victory at Alamein because yeah. of, of being yeah. too aggressive, isn't he just yeah. undoing the good of the victory? Yeah, that is a good point, Paul. And I have to say, um, a senior um, member of the of two NZ division once challenged me on this guy. I've been quite critical of Freiburg's handling of the three left hooks he can uh, he conducted, accusing Freiburg of being too cautious. And he said to me, look, when you've had your when you stuck your neck out and had it chopped off twice, as the New Zealanders had at places like Minka Kaim and uh, at at uh, Rewise at Ridge and, and so on, you're very cautious about doing it again, you know, and yeah. if you don't have to, why why do it? Um, so I, I think that you're quite right. There is a, there's a reason for this caution. The only thing I'd say is that maybe that caution let opportunity slip by, which, uh, but you know, is that being wise in hindsight? I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm not certain. Well, I mean, but that, but that, there, that, you... that kind of, that kind of discussion follows Montgomery throughout his career. I mean, you could make the same debate about um, the, the Falaise Gap in Normandy. Is that you mm. know, mm. there, mm. there was a, maybe a little bit of a lack of of urgency and aggression, and the victory mm. could have been mm. bigger. Mm. But you can kind of understand. Mm. I think, I mean, mm. I, I'm playing the devil's advocate there because I'm not a Montgomery, Montgomery fan as a human being, although I think he's 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 massively underrated yep. as a commander of forces. But yep. I think you have to kind of always consider the the tools he's playing with and the resources he's yeah, got. Yeah. And I think he's always yeah. aware of, of how yeah, much yeah. there is limited behind him. In the British Army by 42, as with the Australian New Zealand Army, it's kind of getting towards the bottom of the barrel. There's not that much more to come. With the USA, of course... Is only beginning mm -hmm. to really pull its resources together, but I think Montgomery knows that he's he's always going to have a, a limited amount of stuff coming in. So I think it's just that should be held yeah. in the back of one's mind. But yeah, this is enthralling. So Medanine, let's get back to that. Uh yeah, Medanine. I'm 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 pre pretty much done with it. I will point okay. out there are some some other battles, uh, particularly sure. the Marath Line and Tobago Gap. Now, this is, uh, when I'm talking about Marath Line and Tobago Gap, I'm talking about Montgomery's assault on the Marath Line on the 20th of March. 
the New Zealand division is boosted to a core and it conducted a difficult march to reach to get to Baga Gat, which is getting him behind the enemy position after a very difficult uh, the night march. Now, the frontal assault on the Marath line had failed and Freiburg was to deliver this solid blow um, in the rear. And that once again, this indicates Montgomery's ability to adjust uh, his plans and switch the direction of the attack. And on the 26th of March, they, they launch a huge attack on, on, on this position at Tabaga Gare. And it is a blitzkrieg style of, it, of operation. The New Zealanders attack in the day uh, with the sun behind them, which is most unusual because they're usually doing night attacks. It is the perfect coordination of ground and air forces. There's excellent cooperation of armour, artillery, infantry. At long last, the Allies are learning how to make war and put it all together in a coordinated air Effort. The battle for the Marath line in Tobago Gap, but this is March 1943. As I mentioned before, it's taken them uh, some time uh, to, uh, to to reach that state. Now, the Axis forces are being squeezed and confined um, into an area in northern Tunisia. They're squeezed between the 8th Army in the south and the 1st Army in the north. There is still some stiff fighting, particularly at places like in Fideville, Takruna, but they're steadily being starved of supplies um, because each time a supply uh, supply vessels are in, in the ocean, they're being picked off because the Allies are so well informed by Ultra. So they're all convoys are halted uh, to North Africa, all Axis convoys are halted by the end of March 1943. So without fuel, with limited ammunition and being squeezed ever into a small of pockets with their backs against the Mediterranean. This is only going to end in one way with their capitulation on in the 13th of May 1943, where 275,000 Axis forces laid down their arms. That is a defeat similar to Stalingrad and it eliminates German reserves in the Mediterranean. Let me conclude and happy to take any questions or comments. North Africa was at the beginning, always a sideshow for the Germans, and that most of this campaigning, they had something like three divisions fighting there, two armoured divisions and a light infantry division, compared with over 200 for the for Operation Barbarossa. But for Britain and Italy, this is their main theatre of war for land operations for, you know, almost half the war from, from certainly from 1940 to the middle of 1943. The US become involved for political reasons. Um, Hitler's uh, belated decision to reinforce the Axis in North Africa after Operation Torch and not before it was disastrous. I mean, you, there's a... Uh, saying in, in uh, military affairs that you never reinforce failure, but that's exactly what he did. It delayed the outcome of that, that theatre by only months, but certainly magnified the scale of defeats some tenfold. And North Africa would be this current springboard for an advance into Europe via Sicily and via Italy. Now, the battles I've been talking about, particularly in this later stage, El Alamein, Medanine, Tunisia, uh, to 1942-1943, a part of this major shift in the war effort, what other historians have called the turn of the tide. The point I would make is that the 2nd New Zealand Division was at the forefront of nearly all of those 8th Army victories in North Africa, but this is a critical point where the string of victories for Germany are over. Germany has now lost the initiative. They could not win the war unless this major coalition against them fell apart. And like Germany in 1914-18, they could not fight a war on two or three fronts and expect to win. However, in May 1943, the war was far from over. This is just the start of the turn of the tide. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Well, brilliant. I'm glad we got amazing stuff, Glenn. Yeah, well, well, let's keep on going till we till you have any internet problems. And the first question is for me, it's about the um the fact that Germans kind of considered it a sideshow. And I I'm I'm with you on that. And I wonder how much of that hmm. filtered through in the in the 60s, 70s, and uh, when the German generals were writing about that in German historians, because the North African campaign was seen as the clean war, wasn't it? There was no, you know, the SS weren't there. It wasn't the atrocities. It wasn't the Holocaust, although we could argue all those elements are present. But so the people that, you know, mm. the Luftwaffe commanders are writing about it. And I think it was always considered 
I think the Germans managed to write write about it without sort of admitting it was a defeat. They kind of just shifted over to the ETL yeah. or the Eastern Front, and I think that yeah. has permeated through some of the staff ride thinking in the Britain is that that is that North Africa was just a sideshow. It was it was unimportant, and I think when we've been talking about this couple of weeks is that it is not just North Africa. It's the, it's the battle of the Mediterranean as well. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's taking on the improvements of tactical air power to the ETO, the use of artillery, as you said yourself, mm. some of the things Freiburg and his artillery people come up with are, are, are rolled out for the entire British army. So this idea of it being a, a size show that should be put to bed immediately, I think, because it, it clearly mm. isn't. So that, that's my first kind mm -hmm. of point stroke question. Yep. Um, mm. And the second one is from Errol, so one of our New Zealand viewers, and he's saying, so how much of a loss were the New Zealand troops drawn off to the LRDG? Um, well, the, uh, that's a good question. They weren't a loss because the numbers were never great, but you are talking about some of the most, um, you know, most skillful, practical soldiers. Um, and the, the argument is how much the, the, the work of the um, Long Range Desert Group actually achieved in, in the victory. It certainly destroyed a hell of a lot of uh, German aircraft uh, behind lines in that. But uh, it, while New Zealanders did make up a, up a large number, we're talking about hundreds rather than rather than yeah. thousands and, and not that, uh, that uh, draining of resources. Although he does, it's a good point when you consider that New Zealand didn't get any re reinforcements for the whole of 1942. But really, uh, you know, several hundred w wouldn't have wouldn't have made that much difference. Getting back to your point, Paul, about sideshow, it is a sideshow, but it is an important one for Britain, particularly in the British Commonwealth, um, and particularly as a as a grounding and a testing ground for getting the correct doctrine. Um, you know, actually learning how to wage these modern wars, uh, things that they've forgotten about. You know, they learned learned it the hard way in in the First World War, that uh, learning curve or the blood curve, and yet they make you know, so many mistakes again in 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 the second world war particularly with the use of armor um mm. one of the things i was concerned to do in the battle of north africa was actually to balance the ledger a little bit in terms of um of how the germans commanders were viewed uh, particularly rommel um and your, your point about this being you know a, a good clean war i think there was a book came out called war without hate which um you know i i've it was a great, great book, but I'm sure there was a lot of hate when when people were, were fighting and, and dying and killing each other. Um, but uh, the one of the things I was concerned to do was actually balance the ledger a little bit by actually pointing out that Rommel, while he has all these books written about him and several people claim he's a military genius, um, probably wasn't the genius people made it out to be. And Montgomery wasn't the clown that uh, that other people have pointed him out to be, particularly people like Corelli Barnett, waging an unnecessary battle, not being able to command properly. And um, American generals too have been very disparaging of, um, of Montgomery. I wanted to point out that Rommel probably wasn't as great as people made out and Montgomery wasn't as bad. I mean, it's, it's some ways an unlikable character as you pointed out but he's not a bad general yeah no i mean craig tibbetts made the point from australia yesterday uh that that rommel was at least one level too high up he 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 was mm -hmm. he was a, a reasonable a, a very good dynamic general but basically the job of a, of, of commanding an entire force was was beyond his uh, abilities and that his mm. failure to grasp logistics and the big picture and into, was was his weakness and that Le mm -hmm. leave, you know, the, the Peter principle, leave him as commanding a division or, 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 or a small group of divisions and, and that he was good at to being dashing and the mobile mm -hmm. warfare he is he is good at. But on a, on a larger level, that's where he loses to Montgomery, who has seems to me a much better grasp of the of, of the all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, the, the, the rear of the spear rather than the tip of the spear. Rommel is a tip of the spear guy. Yep. Um, and, yep. and, and quite good at that. We've got a couple more questions. So one from um, Ian Carr, regular viewer. Um, were there significant moves to return New Zealand forces to the Pacific with the advance of the Japanese? Yeah, good, good question. Yes, there were. And it was um, a question that the New Zealand government at the time agonised over. Um, and they considered and they raised the question three times. Um, and... They that really they uh, what ca what it came down to was the advice of the British Prime Minister Churchill saying you know it'd be terrible if the New Zealanders left the scene of their glories and so on. He really l l laid the praise on thick, but it was the Americans who actually said well you know, that's going to tie up a hell of a lot of shipping and, you know, we've actually sent Marines to New Zealand, so there's no um, no uh, real threat to them anymore and you're better off 
off to keep your men where they are against the enemy. They know how to fight, and actually, you know, that that is the best situation. But there was a lot of pressure put on, but the New Zealand government weighed it up and came down on the on the firm view that it was best to keep two NZ Div in the fighting in North Africa and Italy rather than bring them back home. They did try and have a division fighting in the South Pacific, but there was they had to curtail that at the end of uh, at the beginning of 1944 because they just didn't have enough men to have, have two divisions fighting. It was always a two brigade division anyway. And in the Pacific, they, the New Zealanders made their main effort through air. And believe it or not, New Zealand had 24 air squadrons operating in the Pacific Theatre of War, which is no no mean feat. But mm. they decided that for the bit, they looked at the bigger picture. This is a global war. Where best can we make our main contribution? And if they're fighting in Italy, they're fighting for, for as much as they're fighting for New Zealand. The Australian government did not agree with them, by the way, and put immense pressure on New Zealand to bring them back. But they, in the end, they, they went with the advice for, of the British Chief of Staff and Prime Minister and what the Americans had said as well and kept, their, kept the people fighting in, in, in Italy. Brilliant answer to that. So um, another one from Edmund O'Sullivan, who is a big writer about the Irish Brigade in Tunisia. Um, and he said, talking about the motivation, he said, uh, with volunteers, what motivated men to fight 10,000 miles from home when New Zealand wasn't being threatened? I mean, you've explained it on a kind of geopolitical level, but how do yeah. you explain that to some, you know, 23 year old lad from Wellington <laughs> as to why he's fighting over in North Africa? Because yeah. we as historians now can see that in World War II, nothing happens in a vacuum and that the Mediterranean mm. is, is, is equally important to the Pacific, as is the Russian front and Lend Lease and the convoys. But you know, you're you're some kid from a farm, and you're over there in North Africa. How how did how did the you know brigade commanders and down at a lower level? How did they explain to these troops, especially after these two big big defeats the New Zealanders have had and being left on that mm. flank there? You know, how do you motivate mm. these guys and telling them that what they're doing, sitting in some piece of sandy rock in an 18 inch shell shell scrape, is protecting New Zealand? Yeah, it's it is difficult, and, it, and it's a very good question. Um, the, the worst time was at the end of Operation Crusader, which, as I said, uh, was New Zealand's worst uh, battle in terms of casualties. And it happened to coincide with uh, the with Pearl Harbor coming just on the on the back of that, the end of 41. And at a time that there was great depression in the New Zealand division at the time, particularly they were homesick, they were worried about their people, you know, there was a threat of invasion and so forth. But, you know, the, and the commanders themselves, you know, some of them felt, well, you know, maybe we should be uh, elsewhere and following the Australian example, but the 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 um the government of the day told you know actually said look you need to need to do this you need to there's a view of it looking at one big war where best can we make our effort we're there we we know how to fight them let let's keep them there uh 1942 though they didn't supply them any reinforcements because they're keeping it back for for the threat of invasion i'll also make a point too that one of the reasons that they that they decided to keep the new zealand division in Italy and the uh, after North Africa to, to go to Italy and keep them in that Mediterranean theatre was that they had a furlough scheme that they could get the long serving guys away. You know, they've been overseas for over, over three years. Let's uh, have a furlough scheme for long serving people, get them back to New Zealand and uh, give them a, th a three month uh, holiday and then bring them back. You know, they'll be nice and fresh and so on. Problem with that was the furlough guys. Ninety percent of them refused to go back um, because they were they, they, they saw it was a good idea at the time, but it backfired um, and it led to what um, one British historian said: the greatest single action of ill discipline in New Zealanders and in, 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 in military history. Uh, it was more like a strike than than um, than you know a mutiny. But they they did refuse to go back, um, having seen you know what was happening. But but that was not because of the Japanese threat, but seeing conditions in New. New Zealand, and you know, people who who, who had um, who had not served, who who had uh, nice cushy jobs, um, and, and so on. And as I say, they refused to go back. So it is a, com a com complex issue. But the New Zealand government had decided this is where we'll make our effort, uh, our main land effort, and it'll be in North Africa and Italy. And uh, if you're conscripted, um, that's where you're going to fight. New Zealand introduced conscription relatively early in the war, in 1940, but you could be conscripted only into the army. The Navy and Air Force were all volunteers. So if you're right. conscripted, you go in the army and, the, and you're going to probably be fighting in Italy. Okay, well, that was a brilliant response. So the next one is predictably about Freiburg. Um, and and we talked about him in the in the the, the Crete show. Um, but you know, 
he is a divisive figure amongst New Zealand historians and, and historians generally. But what's your assessment of him as a commanding officer? But I'll kind of limit it to the, to the North African campaign. Oh, we lost Glenn again there. We'll, we'll come back in a minute there, um, I'm sure. I'm back. No, oh, yeah. I, heard, I, heard, I heard the question. Assessment of Freiburg, I think he's a uh, very good fighting commander, um, very uh, you know experienced. He's probably the commander we needed to have. I mean, he never served in New Zealand um, be in New Zealand forces before the Second World War. He'd always served, um, had been born in the UK, uh, lived in New Zealand, spent a form of years. He had joined the territorial force, but had fought as part of the British Army. So initially he comes across as being a pucker English uh, commander, and it takes some time to, as uh, people argue, discover himself as a New Zealander. I think he was a fine divisional commander. I think think he was probably stretched uh, when he became a core commander. Uh, I think Montgomery summed them up best. And Montgomery said of him, um, he's the best fighting divisional commander in the world, but he has no great brains, and that is the limit of his abilities. Um, and I think there's a lot in that, because when you look at Freiburg, uh, when he's given command above um, the division, and talking about Crete, I'm talking about uh, Casino, where he's a core commander, and even at Tobago Gap, where he's a bit hesitant, uh, we, the three times he has a core command, he doesn't perform that well. And, and, and in Crete, um, he's uh, he, he, I think, contributes to the disaster by the, by the fact that uh, he's not there directing and, and making sure that his, his orders are being followed. And at Monte Casino, I think he, we don't see him at his best either. Having said that, Freiburg is in is in command of the division for nearly six years, from 39 to 45. Comes back to New Zealand on a, on a brief uh, visit, but is is fated from you know uh, all these um, dinners and public addresses and so forth. The man didn't have a rest for that time. He's got to be tired, and I think we find him probably at at his lowest ebb for the casino battle when he's very tired. We find all those times his son has just disappeared and he doesn't know where he is. He's fighting him. He's actually uh, uh, there in the Vatican, being hidden in the Vatican, and we don't see him at his best in in, in casino. Um, uh, Freiburg is is uh, in an aircraft crash in in middle of 1944. Gets taken to hospital. Has about three months off, and when he comes back, he's almost a new man. And the division performs exceptionally well at the end of the Italian campaign. But uh, Freiburg, I don't think, is a military genius. I think he's a great tactical commander, great divisional commander. Above that, I think it's, his performance is questionable. Well, Matthew Wright said similar about the fact that regardless of his abilities. Uh, he was at it a long time and was wounded a number of times and out of the oh. picture. So in just sheer staying power, he has a survivability. He, he is worth, yeah. you know, recognizing. I mean, because, you know, we talk about, you know, it's a buzzword of the stress of leadership and politicians having to have breaks. And, the, mm. you know, it, it, mm. it's, it's understood now that having big responsibility comes with mental pressures. And I think, considering how long some of these commanders were, you know, going from one battle to other battle to other campaign, having to constantly mm. relearn, reinvent the wheel because the fighting in Crete is different. The fighting in North Africa was different again to Italy. You know, yeah. you have to cut these guys some slack of just how long they are at it and how, oh. and how conversely as historians, how long we have sitting in our comfortable chairs to assess them. You know, we're, we're not we're not assessing their abilities whilst under pressure sitting in a shell scrape in Tobruk. We're doing it in a nice yeah, comfy exactly. office generally. So I think they're cutting them some slack there. And it's interesting about the, the length of time they're in because one of our Australian view viewers says, as an Aussie, I feel the second New Zealand division was overused. They had three whole brigades replaced in 40, 42. They should have come home in 43 before Italy. So as an entire division, they are, as you said yourself, they are at the sharp end for a long time. Uh, it's, you mm -hmm. know, when we talk about some of the American units coming over in the ETO and doing a year in combat, and we're not belittling their, their involvement at all, but some of the Allied units had been four, five, even towards six years of at the front line, which is is a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree. I think the the use of the New Zealand division and, and even uh, Ninth Australian in, in some ways, you know, they have a hell of a long war. Some of these people, and uh, 
as I, I think uh, Kippenberger said, because he's arguing against doing another attack. He's arguing against using the New Zealand infantry for, for Operation um, uh, Operation Supercharge. He says, you know, look, we, we don't have very easy, I like his phrase, we've only got about 2,000 bayonets left. You know, he's referring to infantry, and the God knows how survivors of how many battles, you know. How, how are you going to keep, how are often are you going to keep using these people um yeah. I, I would point out though that that, that the, after the end of, end of um of north africa 43 there was the furlough scheme um and and the new zealand division was rested but then in theater in the italian campaign and uh, and freiburg and the new zealand government refused to allow them to be used in sicily um that montgomery wanted to use them in sicily almost immediately after the north african campaign mm. and i think if they had been used that, that would have been even more disastrous for the new zealanders so they did get some opportunity to to, to rest but they are often at the sharp end and yeah. they 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 fight battle after battle and um, i mean that, that's something that uh, you have to admire them for. I, I think in many ways, you know, the Americans talk about uh, uh, this greatest generation. I think these people probably are our most resilient generation in, in some ways. When you think about what I think resilient is in some ways a better word than greatest. Yeah, because greatest implies yeah, yeah. they cannot ever be met, matched. And I, I hate yeah. the idea that we've peaked as a species in, in, yeah. in World War II and that we, we will never get any better. But the most resilient, I think, is very good. But good, my final comment, you know, we, we, the LRDG SAS came up a little bit in your in your discussion earlier. And we are now two days away from the big SAS Rogue Heroes show premiering on mm -hmm. the BBC in the UK. I don't know when it'll hit New Zealand and Australia, but it'll shed a light on Sterling and Paddy May and all those yeah. guys there. And of course, we've got Brendan O'Connell, the New Zealand historian, who's done amazing work about the LRDG yeah. and the New Zealand yeah. contribution. But in 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 the grand scheme of things, when when we focus on special forces in North Africa, are we really just shifting away attention from the where the fighting is actually being done, which is in the you know it's in Crusader, it's in it's in uh, Alam Halfa and and the and the air war and these these special forces missions are despite the number of enemy aircraft destroyed on the ground they are a distraction um it, look I, I think they needed to try something different um and and uh that it was a great idea um of course, a lot, a lot of regular and the commanders of the Eighth Army that weren't weren't too pleased with them and saw it as, saw it as a distraction and, and a waste of resources. Um, I'm not a specialist on the Long Road Desert Group. I've, I've certainly read uh, accounts of what they what they did, um, and I, I have to say I, I reserve judgment. I think if they didn't produce the material aspect of it, they actually in some ways carrying the fight to the enemy, and actually good. You know, they're, they're good for. Um, maintaining morale when the eighth army at times you know morale was almost rock bottom particularly uh when Orkinlek uh is, is fighting el alamein and um, it's a way to a, a not way to strike back and, and try and do something uh, whether it was worth it whether it, the the resources could have been used elsewhere um i i can't comment on that but uh, it's certainly something that, that we need to think about i think that's a, that's a good point, and I think I'm hoping I will do I will do a week of shows following this series and see mm. how well it does globally and how much interest is mm. is is gained by it. I think I will tackle it again and, and look at it because, as you say, measuring special forces and commando missions is often about the the the, um, the impact on the, on the public opinion and belief as it is the actual tangible military results of yeah. it it's you know how much yeah. is some of those commando raids in 40 41 just boost the morale well look at the dam busters with another another <laughs> battle air battle that we're yeah. all involved in did it achieve mm. much not really did it did it set a tone did it make everybody feel that we could do things absolutely so i think that's yeah. why well, yeah. we're going down yeah. potential rabbit holes but glenn it's been amazing yeah. talking to you i can't wait to have you back on again next year when we, we're doing a deeper dive onto the tunisian campaign so um I, i'd like to come back perhaps and 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 talk about one of the, those um the, the casserine uh, kind of era perhaps in some mm, more depth that sure. would be really good but it's been great talking okay. to you so anything else you want to pass your public push or publicize or mention you're working mm -hmm. on no, Paul, I just thank you for the opportunity. And I will say that that uh, program on this is starting here in New Zealand on Monday too, and I will be watching it. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll watch it together. Then. We'll do, a, we'll do a, 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 watch, a watch group yeah. thing, what they call it. Yeah, anyway, well, it's been great yeah, talking good. to you, Glenn. So, folks, I'll be back again later, 7, uh, 8, uh, 7 p.m. UK with Zita Balanza Fletcher. Uh, but as for now, thank you very much for joining us. It's Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.